Today is Christ the King Sunday, which means in the church calendar, it is the last Sunday of the Christian year. The Christian year always starts with Advent. Now, this year it's a little different. Most years, Advent starts this Sunday after Thanksgiving. And therefore, in American churches, we always use the Sunday before Thanksgiving as the Thanksgiving service Sunday. But this is a rare time when Advent is happening next Sunday, and so we have the privilege of being able to use this Sunday after Thanksgiving as Christ the King Sunday. It's our time to exalt Jesus Christ. Those of you who know him, we hope that you will find and draw closer to him in this hour. Those of you who don't know him and are seeking him, we pray that this will point you closer to the truth of his reality. Before we continue, let us bow for a moment of prayer. Dear Holy Spirit, we ask now that you would make the words of your scripture passage, your inspired word, relevant to us, that the words that I speak also will ring true, that we will be able to find hope, excitement, joy, and answers for what we are seeking. Thank you for this time that we have to share your word together. In the name of our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, our King, amen. A four-year-old boy was asked to say grace before Thanksgiving dinner. And the whole family was gathered around, and they all bowed their heads in expectation and waited for his prayer. And waited. And waited. Well, after a long silence, the little fellow looked up to his mother and asked, But if I thank God for the broccoli... Won't he know I'm lying? <laughs> now, I doubt if any of us were lying when you said our, your prayer before this Thursday's past Thanksgiving dinner. But I know that God has blessed you in many, many ways. Well, did you realize the greatest blessing of all the ones you may have thought about and prayed about this past week was God had given us his son, Jesus Christ, the King of the universe. That is his greatest blessing. So since today is Christ the King Sunday, I want to explore a little bit about what Scripture says about him. Well, first, let's see what this title, Christ the King, comes from. Surprisingly, the exact phrase, Christ the King, is not found in the Bible. However, this title is based on a number of different passages throughout Scripture. Let me give you a few examples. The phrase King Eternal is mentioned in 1 Corinthians of Timothy chapter 1, where it says, Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Another example comes from John 1:49, King of Israel. It says, then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. King of the Jews is mentioned in Matthew 2, 2. Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? The wise men said, we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. The Gospel of Matthew states, Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, you have said so. And the phrase king of kings, which is probably what we're most familiar with, occurs several times in the book of Revelation, such as in chapter 17, 14. It says, they will wage war against the lamb, and the lamb will triumph over them because he is lord of lords and king of kings. And Revelation 19, 16 tells us, on his robe and on his thigh, are written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And finally, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. So as you can see, the phrase Christ the King is a summary of numerous passages in Scripture. Well, that's a major point in this morning's scripture found in Colossians. 
Paul's going to make four significant statements about Christ the King. And in making these statements, he's making a counter-argument against some false teachers that were bothering the church in Colossae. They seem to have this system of angels that acted as kind of go-betweens between God and people, thus reducing the nature and role of who Jesus is as our one and only mediator. Well, not only is Paul here going to describe the nature of Christ, he's also going to describe the role of Christ in our daily lives. So let's look at some of the reasons Paul gives in this passage for believing Jesus is the exclusive way to God and the king of the universe. Now, take a look at verse 15, the first half of that for a moment. And regarding his deity, verse 15 says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Now let me ask you by a show of hands, how many of you last May 6th watched the coronation ceremony of King Charles at Westminster Abbey? All right? You noticed all the pomp and circumstance and pageantry that Britain could muster. And in England, the people have a certain kind of respect for who the king and queen may be. There's a whole set of rules and formalities you have to follow if you're to have any contact with the king. Well, it's a little more difficult for us here in America because we don't think in terms of a king with royal authority and us as subjects who obey and bow down to someone. In our culture, we don't have such an individual. Well, fortunately, this verse tells us that to see God, what's it say? All we need to do is look at Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that Christ is the exact image of God in the sense of interior or physical sense. It doesn't mean that God had two eyes and two ears and two arms like Jesus did. By invisible image, Rather, it means that Christ is the likeness like the reflection in a mirror. You see a very similar reflection of who you are in a mirror. It also reveals the nature of who God is found in the person of Jesus Christ. So, this helps eliminate some of the concepts the false teachers were bringing into the Church of Colossae regarding the nature of Christ. He's no longer this shadowy figure. He is God himself, the authoritative one. Now, jump down to verse 19, where this same idea of Christ as the image of God shows up again. Verse 19 tells us, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. So God declared that in Christ resided the full nature of God. We call that his deity. And the way the word live is used here in verse 19 means a permanent residence as opposed to some temporary status. So it wasn't just while Jesus was on earth. It wasn't while Jesus is in heaven. It's all the time Jesus is the fullness of God. No other religious leader, no other philosopher, no other guru can make these supports, support these claims to be God. Because Jesus is everything you would expect God to be. Jesus is perfect, loving, and all wise. Jesus is impartial. His timing is impeccable. His teachings are incomparable. His death was sacrificial. His resurrection was unpassable. That indeed makes him unique. Well, the second area that Paul wants to touch on, another reason for believing Jesus is the exclusive way to God and our king, is found in verses 16 and 17. Now, the, first part of, the last part of verse 15 kind of adds into this. It says, he existed before anything was created, and is supreme over all creation. That means Christ is before all creation in time. He is also over it in rank and dignity. Christ is his father's 
representative, and he's the heir, and he is the manager of all the creation that was committed to him. So when we look again at verse 16 and 17, we're told, for through him, meaning Christ, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through Christ and for Christ. And verse 17 adds, Christ existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. That's a pretty amazing description of who Jesus is. Can you imagine Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel and everyone shrugging their shoulders and say, I could do that. Only a very few people could do that kind of detailed work that Michelangelo did. But the king of the universe, Jesus Christ, is the only one who can generate all matter, space, time, energy, and life. This universe is not the result of chance occurrences. Think about it. It takes more faith to believe this universe came through unguided chance than to believe it exists through an intelligent designer. Basically, Jesus is everything, according to this passage. There is nothing in heaven or on earth that could exist without him. He holds everything together. Many of you are familiar with the late British theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking, who stated, and I quote, the eventual goal of science is to provide a single theory that describes the whole universe, end quote. Well, Christians already know what this theory is. It's Jesus. He is the single uniting force that holds all life together. My apologetics professor in seminary, the late Dr. Norman Geisler, wrote a book with a revealing title about this. I have it here. It's entitled, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Kind of makes you think a little bit. You see, everyone has faith, but everyone doesn't have faith in Jesus as the creator. Because he is the king of all creation, Christ is the best and only solid basis for your faith. When we get to verse 18, Paul adds a third concept of Christ the King. It's related to his position over the church. Note he begins in 18, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. Now, if you didn't have any other evidence for the exclusivity of Christ, this alone is enough. Christ is in a class all by himself because of his resurrection. You remember, may remember late on Good Friday, Joseph of Arimathea came to Pontius Pilate to claim Jesus' body for burial. And Pilate inquired, Joseph, I really don't understand. You're one of the richest men in this region, and you've spent a small fortune on this tomb for you and your family, and you want to give it to this man, Jesus? And Joseph replied, it's just for the weekend. <laughs> you see, Christ was the first to come back from the dead in true resurrection life and never die again. And Christians now share in this new life. You'll note in verse 18 the word he is emphatic. It means Christ alone, Christ and no other, is head of the church. What is the church? It's all the redeemed people of God. And what is his body? The church is a living organism. It's not an organization. 
The church is how Christ carries out his purposes. And it's a union between Christ and his people that's very intimate. You'll note in verse 18, it says, he is the beginning. Christ is the origin and the source of the life of the church. And he is supreme and first in everything. Christ alone is the first place as king. One final point about Christ being king that Paul makes here is found in verse 20. And you'll note it says, and through Christ, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. The word reconciled means to change from an enemy to a friend. And this reference has cosmic significance to the work that Christ did on the cross. One day, all things will be subdued to God's will and made to serve his purposes. However, that day has not yet come. One only need to watch the news to realize that. Entrepreneur Robert Sterling described what many people feel today. He says, and I quote, there's something deeply unwell in our society right now. Something metaphysical seems to have shifted, end quote. Well, what is this metaphysical shift, this feature of modern society that is driving so many people into despair? Well, writing for the Institute of Family Studies at the University of Virginia, sociologist Joseph Davis makes the following quote. He argues that our mental health crisis today is actually at the end of a long process that began well before cell phones and social media and fentanyl. You see, the seeds of all this despair and confusion, he thinks, were sown when people stopped looking to timeless institutions and transcendent realities to give their lives meaning. Instead, we've now turned inward for answers. Davis cites Jennifer Brenny Wallace, who is, in her book, Never Enough, notes that even successful and privileged young people today often feel utterly vacant inside. And the reason they are looking inward for meaning is because they've been taught for decades now by everyone from Disney and Oprah and pop stars and professors to reject external sources of meaning like God and family and country. Their so-called truth is now found within, they claim, while external sources of authority are considered oppressive and stifle authentic individuality. Well, as theologian Carl Truman has demonstrated in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, and I quote, the idea that life's greatest meaning comes from within and from there we express our authentic identity is a recent development. Our ancestors looked beyond self to external sources of authority. In our culture of expressive individualists, many people are finding themselves unchained from God." End quote. We were never meant to invent meaning for ourselves. The demands of our hyper-individualistic society feel unbearable to us because they're unreasonable. We put weight, we put the weight of defining the world on our shoulders, and it's heavier than we can imagine. The self is not big enough to define the truth. This means that solving our mental health crisis will take much more than cutbacks on social media and crackdowns on opiates, and yes, these are all good ideas, but it will take a return to older, less individualistic sources of identity and a willingness to stop treating be yourself or you do you as some kind of profound wisdom. That's why 
announcing Jesus Christ as king is so important today. We need an external, all-wise, and perfect authoritative leader to direct our lives. Who better to do this than the one who created each and every one of us? That's why Christ the King can say he is the only way to God. In addition to his superiority, creativity, and resurrection, he died to bring you back to God. No one else could have ever done that for you. So, Paul adds in verse 21 and 22, he says, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. In verse 22, yet now he has reconciled you to himself. How? Through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single thought. Wow, what powerful words. The phrase far away in verse 21 literally means you used to belong to another owner. You were estranged from God, but now you've been brought to him through your faith and trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the result is you are called holy and blameless and without a single thought at the end of verse 22. Now, this doesn't mean we are perfect. No Christian is perfect, obviously. It refers to the fact, as we learn in the book of Romans, you have already been declared righteous before God. What a great assurance that I know if I were to drop dead right now, I know with full certainty I have a righteous status before God because of my faith in Jesus Christ. So, what were the believers at Colossae told to do to withstand these attacks on their faith? What can you do to withstand such attacks? Well, grow your roots deep. We find this in verse 23. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The phrase firm and drift away means grounded securely as on a rock with steady and firm resolve. So growth for the follower of Christ is meant to be intentional. You must make choices. And that first choice should probably be, where am I going to plant myself? Well, I'm going to plant myself in the word of God and be filled with the spirit of God. The second thing we can do is maintain our hope. We must not give up the hope that we received when we heard the good news and believed in Jesus Christ. You see, Christianity is a way of life. The king demands our allegiance. The king restructures our priorities, our pursuits, our beliefs, our behavior, our career, our family, even our personal identity. We owe all of those things as allegiance to Christ our King. Yet, everything else in our society directs our gaze inward, to ourselves, to our feelings, my priorities, my problems, as if I am the center of the universe. Yet, for 2,000 years, the knowledge and fear of a transcendent Jesus who is king, not helpful social programs, has given true meaning and true direction to life. An overwhelming identity crisis among young people is also a clear indicator of what the church is being called to do in this time and place now. We need to testify to the work of Christ in this world and what can happen when people come to him in faith. Colossians 1 is very clear. Christ was present and at work in creation in God's story, and he is still recreating people today who come to him in faith. 
Proclaiming the good news involves us pointing out God's design of human beings and how he created them in his image. And that must include theological instruction, biblical instruction about the human body, especially in the wake of the dramatic increase in depression and anxiety among teens and adults dealing with regret and facing long-term harm of our culture's worst ideas. Well, the Christians at Colossae and us here today are being encouraged by Paul to withstand these faulty philosophies. God made peace with us by sending his son, the king, to die for us. That, of course, is God's greatest blessing to us. And now, because we have faith in Christ, Christians can stand in the presence of Christ the King. Let's bow for a moment. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for these words that you shared with us today. We pray that you would make us think about how important our allegiance to Christ the King should be in our daily lives. We trust and pray that we will put these things into action and that you will make us aware of how we can share this with others. It's through the name of your great Son, our resurrected King, we pray these things. Amen.